are discussing politics and saying what they think. The right to speak freely is not enjoyed by all peoples of the world. This nation under God set the standard of our concept of man. We're going to save this nation, this world, this country, this community. When I was growing up, we worried my mama, my poor mama to death, me and my brothers and all my friends around South Memphis. I, I think that all of us were a little touched, as my great-grandmother used to say. I think she was trying to say in a nice way that we were crazy. But be it as it may, it was a time when all of us boys enjoyed so many different things that I suppose that boys were supposed to enjoy. When I was growing up, I did all those things. We built tree houses. We had a tree house down on the end of Mallory over near Norris and Corey School, and that thing was three stories high. We had built an elevator, and we could bring stuff up and send food up, and we had our own communication. We had two cans with the string, with the wax on the string. We, we were really, I suppose, the little rascals. Uh, because of some of the things that we did. We built skate trucks and box cars. We took wheels off of our sisters, baby buggies and the wagons and my dad's and my grandfather's wheelbarrows. We, we did all kind of mischievous things to build those things that boys would build. We rolled tires down the middle of the street. We would have tire races down Mallory Avenue, with, and, and you know, when my mama would tell us to stay out of the street, but we would have our tire races down the street. We made parachutes and jumped off the roof. Um, uh, we, we were something else, and, and we watched the Long Ranger and Tonto, high old silver away. I can see the Long Ranger rearing up on that big white horse and Tonto uh, Kimosabe as they were going to get the bad guys. And Zorro, we made our swords and we fought with our handmade mask on. And Gene Autry, Raw Rogers, Have Gun Will Travel, Paladin, and um, uh, Hopalong Cassidy, Elliot Nist. Little did we know that when we were watching Bob Gibson play baseball, Johnny Unitas, Joe Namath, Cassius Clay, Sugar Ray Leonard, we did not know that we were being corrupted and warped, programmed, misled to believe that God had made us boys. We just didn't know. We, we didn't realize that there was this nationalized uh, um, programming where spiritual and religious leaders had made a decision to force us into masculinity and boyhood and manhood and put things in front of us to seduce us to act in the way that we were doing. We just, we didn't know. We thought we were enjoying doing that stuff. We had no idea that that was this sinister plan to turn us into boys when we really wanted to wear tutus, put on ballerina shoes, and dance around like little girls. We just didn't know that there was something this sinister that was working on us. But according to the academians today, and all of these big shot eggheads who have prefixes and suffixes on their names, they say that gender is not something that is natural and is ordained of God, but it is something that y'all have put off on boys and girls to give them masculine and feminine behavior because it suits you that they have that type of behavior. So uh, we didn't realize that our minds were being poisoned and contaminated with toxic masculinity, that our personalities were being warped and impaired and injured with the venom of social engineering. We just didn't know. I really thought I was enjoying riding my stick horse and pretending that I was Hopalong Cassidy. When you start talking about these issues that the fake news and fake media and the fake commentators and the fake academians and the fake social engineers come up with, they always come up with all these new terms. These days we got homophobia and we got uh, some other types of phobias and we've got toxic masculinity and we've got all of these the terms that define 
somebody's warped point of view of what they think the world ought to be. And then they speak of it in such a way that it just came down from heaven and they were enlightened by someone that edified, enlightened them and opened their minds so all of us idiots can see what we were unable to see before they saw it. So when I search for this politically concocted uh, term of toxic masculinity, of course you go to the internet where you find everything that's true. And we found, I found the details of what it is. And, and as you surmise that some wayward group has come up with this from the progressive agenda as they are trying to move the world in a certain direction and in a certain way, and it's the name they give to one of those behaviors that they vehemently oppose, men acting like men, women acting like women. What in the world is wrong with us? According to the internet, the concept of this, this term, toxic masculinity, is used in psychology and gender studies to refer to various standards, various norms, that according to these psychologists are associated with the harm that society has placed upon men with their traditional stereotypes. They contend that erroneously present men socially in a dominant fashion, which includes stuff like misogyny and homo homophobia and other terms that they come up with. In today's world, men acting as God ordained them to act, it defies and retards the progressive ambitions of the devil and his messengers. So let's be real frank about it. You know, it doesn't matter how many $10 names we give to it and how many uh, uh, professors and PhDs and big shots that speak on it and how many news commentators sit there trying to look serious while they speak stupidity. At the end of the day, this is the devil's business because the devil wants to undo all that God has done. And he can only do it if we are foolish enough to accept the stuff that he sends us as though it is some type of fact, as though it has credibility, and though it's something that we ought to be debating in the marketplace. This is a definite agenda that the devil intends to undo God's creation, to uncreate the creation. The devil, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, is a sleazy schemer. That's what he is. That's what he's always been. And that's what he always will be, who uses lies, misinformation, delusion, distraction, in order to destroy, destroy us and entice us rather to destroy ourselves by rebelling against God because that's all this is. At the end of the day, when we see all of this stuff that we see on the news, that we have become accustomed to hearing every day, all the alphabets that we hear, all the new terms that we hear, we hear in one of our northern newspapers, it had an elected official in the marriage of his male partner kissing right on the front of the newspaper for everybody to see. Lord have mercy, what has happened to us? When we take an introspective examination of ourselves, all of us will say we saw it coming, didn't we? There are no, no uh, individual, informed individual, especially of the ministers, elders, deacons, teachers, mamas and daddies, grandmamas, great grandmamas and great granddaddies, all of us that are in this room this morning, every one of us know we saw it coming. And you heard me say the last time I was here, I said everybody wants to talk about the lost generation, but nobody really wants to talk about who lost them. And at the end of the day, when we look at the mess that we have, we've got to say to ourselves, if we're honest to ourselves, and ask ourselves the simple question. The Lord said that we are the light of the world, that we are. 
Not the Congress, not the Senate, not the President, not the Supreme Court, not all of these crazy people that we elect to make our laws that govern our lives and the way we raise our children. God said, you are the light of the world. And the Lord said, let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify the Father in them. One of those good works that God should have seen and should see and continue to see from every one of us is us speaking against those things that are an abomination in the face of God. That when this nation lifts itself up in arrogance to the extent that we will in high-handed transgression tell God to get out of our business because we run this place and not him. That's exactly where we find ourselves today. And the devil has found us at the right time in history to where we are a nation for the most part who rebels against God. And you know what? That's an untruth I just told you because there are more of us than there are of them. They're louder, they're more persistent, they're bullies, they are without standard, they are without decorum, and we step back from them as though we are afraid of them. And the Lord ain't happy about that. He ain't happy about that at all. The devil, this sleazy schemer, he sold death in paradise. So the devil knows how to sell a lie. Nobody can sell a lie better than the devil. And there's never been a bigger lie, a more sleazy scheme than to demasculize men and feminize them and masculize women and defeminize them. There's never been a more brilliant man. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Because the Bible lets me know that God formed man from the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Because God said, let us make man in our own image. And God said that he created them, male and female created he them. In essence, God assigned gender and all the emotional, spiritual, and psychological idiosyncrasies and proliferies and characters that go along with being male and female. It came from God. We didn't make it up. We didn't dream it up. We didn't draw it up. We didn't imagine it. It came from God. When Adam opened his eyes as a man, there is man defined by God and what Adam should have been as the federal head of mankind. When God put Adam in a sleep, opened his side, took a rib from his side, made the woman and placed her at his side, indicating she's not his slave nor his master, but another self. God brought them together and as the prophet said, the threefold cord, is not easily broken, psychological, emotional, and physical. When you have that man and that woman who have that threefold cord, my brother back there was just speaking how he and his wife, what you say, 50 years or 60 years? 50 years. Why? Because that threefold cord that is not easily broken. Adam stood there without a mama and a daddy physically. Didn't grow up in a family with brothers and sisters. And God gave him the privilege of speaking to you and me here in 2019. Our big brother Adam, my father Adam, said, For this cause, because she's bones of my bones and flesh of my flesh, for this cause she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain, they're two different individuals, they twain shall become one flesh, a process of two individuals, wired different, spiritually different, socially different, emotionally different, but when they bring that together, there is a strength that's unbreakable. And that's what Adam was given the privilege of defining marriage. And one was masculine and the other was feminine. 
the devil says, I got to do something about this. So the devil came and sold death in paradise. In the book of Genesis chapter 3 verses 4 and 5, the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. When she gave God's law clearly and succinctly, God said you shall not eat of this tree. If you eat of this tree, you shall die. She did not do it ignorantly. She was seduced. She was seduced. It wasn't she didn't have the information. She was seduced not to use the information. It was not that she didn't know the command. She was seduced to disobey the command. It was not that she didn't know the standard and where the line was drawn. She was seduced to transgress the line and to go across it and in high-handed transgression do what God told her not to do. That's where we find ourselves as a society. Nobody with any common sense, any common sense, one drop of common sense, don't know that men and women are different, that God created them different, that they act different, talk different, want different things, have different ways and different definitions of respect. Anybody with common sense knows this, but the devil has to undo what we already know. Otherwise, how are you going to sell toxic masculinity? If you can sell death in paradise, you can sell anything. Paul warns Christians in Corinth of false doctrine and hostility to his apostleship and hostility to God's law. When the apostle Paul spoke to them in the hotbed of sin, in the midst of the Romans' power, he said, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused or promised or betrothed you to one husband that I might present you a chaste virgin to Christ. But then Paul says, I've got some fears because there's someone after you to change you and alter you and detour you and distract you. Paul said, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguile, seduced, and deceived Eve. Notice what he says, through his subtility. So your minds should be corrupted. Listen at that word, corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. We're being corrupted from something simple, husband, wife. How do you get more simple than that? We're being corrupted from something simple, male and female. How do you get more simple than that? Now we've got folks who are advocating that when a child is born, you don't put on this birth certificate male or female, but that you leave it blank. And you give that child a certain number of years to decide if they want to be a boy or if they want to be a girl. And if they decide they want to be a girl, then you go back and alter and amend the birth certificate and put girl on the birth certificate. I'm not making, you can't make this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. I'm giving you the facts. This is what's happening in our nation right now that puts on this money in God we trust. This is what's happening in a nation right now that God has been so good to, that we have made a decision to transgress even the simplicity of our law, of his law. As Paul talked to the brethren at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and verses 4, Paul said, but if our gospel be hid, if it's veiled, if it's not clear, if it's not clearly preached, if it's not stood for, if Christ is not lifted up from the earth, the apostle Paul, when he gave the catalog of abomination to, Tim to Timothy, and all the terrible things that men shall do in that time when they refuse to endure sound doctrine. You know what Paul said the remedy was? Paul said, preach the word. Preach the word. What's our responsibility today in the days where folks are wearing their man buns and switching real pretty and being real feminine and getting in touch with the feminine side? Preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's our job. 
Our job is not to go alone, to get alone. Compromise, capitulate, moonwalk away from the truth. Our job is to preach the word. So when the apostle Paul continued to speak to them about our gospel being veiled, he said, in whom the gods of this world, 1 Corinthians 4 and verses 4, of this world had blinded, notice what he said, had blinded the mind of them which believe not, which are susceptible, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Never forget the intent of the devil's program. His sleazy program is intended on removing the sobriety of this nation to blind us to what is right, what is true, to make us walk away from fidelity and faithfulness in God and to make us believe that man has the right to create his own morality, his own principles, and decide on that which he considers to be his own integrity. So Peter said, listen, y'all need to wake up. Y'all need to wake up. Peter said, you need to be sober. You need to be vigilant because your adversary, you have an opponent. America has an opponent. The world has an opponent. The America, the devil wants you to disappear. You've got more Bibles in this country. You've got gospel preachers. You've got young men learning to be gospel preachers. You've got all of this going on. The devil wants you to cease. And you, members of the Church of Christ, you're the last man standing. The last man standing. You are public enemy number one. The devil wants the church to cease to exist because you're the only one standing. You're the only one preaching the gospel. You're the only one that can get a prayer through who God has promised you to listen to your prayers. The devil wants you to cease to exist. So Peter says, listen, you need to be sober. Don't get drunk with your own agendas. Don't get drunk with your own ideas. Don't get drunk with your own scruples. Don't get drunk minimizing what's important and maximizing what is not important. You need to fight this battle. Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, and he calls him by name, the devil is a roaring lion. Your vicious predator who wants to destroy everything you believe so that you don't have a right to study the Bible, so that you don't have a right of free speech to stand up and preach it, so that you don't have a right to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, so that you don't have a right to pick up this old Bronze Age out of style book and preach it book, chapter and verse. Don't you understand what the devil is doing? Toxic masculinity is a smoke screen for the big agenda. And the big agenda is to destroy the standard. If there is no standard, then everything is right. Jeremiah said, oh Lord, y'all know where it is in Jeremiah 10. Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. Mankind can't devise something that's right. Mankind comes up with toxic masculinity. Mankind comes up with LGBTQRSTUVW. <laughs> Mankind comes up with a children, young girls who sit at a college campus, Google it if you want to. Young girls sitting at a college campus with a sign that says parasites don't have rights because they have clearly said that the child that is within their womb that ought to be the safest place on earth for an unborn child in a womb under its mother's heart, that that child is a parasite and that it has no rights. That's the devil's plan. Make folks close this book. Make them stop reading the standard. Make them stop saying there is law. Make them stop saying there's a biblical standard of morality, a biblical standard of ethics, and make them close the book. He says, be sober, 
Be vigilant, open your eyes, because your adversary he calls him by name the devil. What a great marketing ploy. Toxic masculinity. Because we're used to the term toxic. We've seen it on bathroom products and kitchen products and on the side of trucks that are carrying poison. We see the skull and cross bones. So it has a powerful imagery. And the devil knows how to do that. So he goes toxic masculinity. Masculinity that makes men abusive and make them mean and make them murderers and killers and thieves and misogynists and they go on and on. Well, you know what? That sounds like sin to me. That, that sounds like, don't it, don't it, uh, brother, brother Terry, that sounds like sin. Seemed to me like God said that sin is transgression of God's law, whether a male is doing it or a female is doing it. Where has God ever condoned sin? Where has God ever said male or female have the right by gender to break his law? I can see Jesus with a woman who is caught around a bunch of men who are probably abusive and misogynist as they give the term, who didn't respect that woman who didn't have many rights in that day. That poor woman was drug out, probably clutching a, a few strings of clothes and trying to cover herself because the Bible says they caught her in the very act of sexual immorality. And they drugged that poor woman. Can you see them throwing her and her clutching and trying to cover herself, knowing that she's dead man walking because of the people that surround her? Jesus didn't say, you know what, fellas, y'all gone and get rid of her and use some slur against her. Jesus didn't do any such thing. But Jesus made those men look within themselves and judge them. What kind of man can make men drop rocks? What kind of man can make men look within themselves and realize that they are sinning against God? That's what Jesus did. The Bible says they dropped their stones and walked away because they were to be blamed. God has never, Jesus has never condoned the type of things that folks want to put in all of this negative imagery. What's the problem? These people are messengers of the devil. In John chapter 80, verses 44, Jesus said to a group of people one time, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, abode not in truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, speak it of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus said the devil is a liar. He's a liar. Toxic masculinity is a lie. The feminization of America is a lie. In essence, when, when we think about the strength of femininity, I had a hip operation last year uh, when I was at PTP. A couple of years ago, I was in so much pain I could barely walk. I went from the pulpit to the bed, from the bed to the pulpit in order to preach. And when I would get up and move and that sharp pain would go all over my body, I told my brother, I said, I have the greatest respect for women because if childbirth feels anything like this, I got the greatest respect for them. And I said that if men had to be babies, this place would be a desert because, uh, you know, I, 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 I have respect for them for what they can do. God gave them that strength. They gave them the strength, the sacrifice. I watched my mama many times when she sacrificed and she stood by my father and she raised her children and she did without herself so that her children could have. I watched her many times when she cried over us and I told y'all about her switch that turned corners. But she loved us enough to discipline us and raise us in the nurture and admonition of God and take us to church and teach us at night and read the Bible to us at night and pray with us at night. There was a strength that I saw in my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother. I don't want to hear folks try to redefine femininity. I don't want to hear it. 
I've watched my grandfather who played, who plowed mules, who couldn't read and write because he said he had to work for his family. I watched that man be able to fix anything. He could take anything apart. He could fix a washing machine, a diesel engine, and he taught himself how to do it. I looked at his strength of his character, of his frame. He smiled a big smile and he said, Nick, you always make sure you speak to people and make sure they know who you are. And everywhere he went, folks called him Slim. They would say, hey, Slim. And they would take care of him at the bank. They would take care of him everywhere he went because he was a man. He took care of his family. My father, a Korean War veteran, when he came home, I watched him work two and sometimes three jobs and then still preach on Sunday because he had to take care of his fledgling family. Family. I don't want to hear folks talk about toxic masculinity. I know what it means to be a man. When the apostle Paul told the brethren, he said, quit ye like men. Paul said, be strong. That's what God needs from us. He don't need for us to capitulate and apologize. Eve took lead first. And because of that sin, God took lead away. And God don't apologize. But Jesus came into this world through the woman, brought her, in, her integrity back. And therefore, God lifted her up. I brought this up here because when I was at Pearl Harbor recently preaching, this is the St. Louis Star Times, and it talks about that day, December 7th, when Roosevelt stood up and declared war with, with, with Japan. And on that day, men and women volunteered by the thousands and prepared to fight an enemy. Men stormed the beaches on D-Day knowing that thousands of them would die instantly from the machine guns that were hunkered in on that beach from the enemy. Men have stood and raised their children and taken care of this nation. If the devil can so fool us, lie to us, delude us, and make us walk away from what God ordained for you to be. Joshua stood and said to the children of Israel, he said, if it seem evil for you to serve the Lord, choose you this day who you will serve. A lot of y'all haven't chosen sides yet. Choose, choose you this day who you will serve. But Joshua went on to say, as for me, this man, as for me, showing godly masculinity, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Don't you let these sinners, liars, crooks, jugglers, corrupters, perverters make us walk away from what God ordained men to be. We're going to save this nation, this world, this country, this community.